alone, what is our only confidence? That our souls to Him belong, who holds our days within His hand, what comes apart from His command, and what will keep us to the end? The love of Christ in which we stand. Oh, sing hallelujah, our hope springs eternal. Oh, sing hallelujah, now and ever we confess Christ our hope. What truth can call the troubled soul? God is good, God is good. Where is His grace and goodness known? In our great Redeemer's blood, who holds our faith when the fears arise, who stands above the stormy's trial, who sends the way that bring us nigh unto the shore, the rock of Christ. Oh, sing hallelujah, our hope springs eternal. Oh, sing hallelujah, now and ever we confess Christ our hope in life and death. Unto the grave, what will we sing? Christ, he lives, Christ, he lives. And what reward will heaven bring? Everlasting life with him. There we will rise to meet the Lord. And sin and death will be destroyed. And we will feel for endless joy when Christ is ours forevermore. Oh, sing hallelujah, our hope springs eternal. Oh, sing hallelujah, now and ever we confess Christ our hope in life and death. God who never fails 
that sealed the promise your buried body began to breathe out of the silence the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me Jesus yours is the victory hallelujah praise the one who set me free hallelujah death has lost its grip on me you have broken every Thirty-eight years old, I could not run a single mile without walking. I was breathing heavily, walking up steps, and couldn't even carry in the groceries without getting tired. I was stuck and I needed to change. It wasn't like I was doing something horrible, but I had changed from a kid raised in the forest to an office worker staring at a screen all day. So when I took that first run attempt, I stayed out there for a long time maybe an hour and a half, running some, walking a lot, and promising myself I would be back for more. I returned the next day, and the next, and the next. And by the end of the summer, I could run through the forest for hours at a time without stopping. At one point, I decided I should take on a race after all of this time alone in the wilderness. And since I was already running for hours at a time, I looked for races longer than a marathon and discovered something called an ultra-marathon. Yes, this is any race longer than a marathon, with some covering 100 miles or more. Well, that goal of 100 miles became stuck in my mind. I thought if I could even finish 100 miles, I could do anything. So the next summer, I signed up for the Knock on Wood race. It was in Greenville, South Carolina. I told my family I would run as far as I could, but I never mentioned a distance. I mean, who runs 100 miles, right? So on Saturday, June 5th, 2015, at the age of 39, I was sitting on the sidewalk 30 minutes before the race with second thoughts. I told myself, if I leave now, no one will even know. But I was determined to run, to try, to give it my best shot. The day was hot, but by nightfall, I had finished 50 miles and was determined to walk the rest if I had to. I would later discover my wife was freaking out because I had not stopped with the 50K runners who had finished hours earlier. And at night, with only a headlamp and a bottle of water, I prayed and ran and walked and prayed and ran and walked some more through a South Carolina forest. When I crossed the finish line after the next sunrise, my time was 24 hours and 20 minutes. I remember putting my hands on my knees to keep from collapsing And I asked, how did I do? Congrats, third place, is what I heard. I had no idea. All I knew is that I had finished, but I had redefined my finish line. At 39 years old, I joked I had finally found a sport I was good at. But the truth is, is that I found myself on an impossible journey through circumstances beyond my ability to accomplish a goal God had prepared for me. And I'm not the first to experience this. Perhaps you have too. You're not sure how you ended up where you are today, but you are in a challenging situation that can only be successful if God shows up. Otherwise, you are doomed and you know it. We could look at several examples of people in the Bible who had this experience, but today I want to focus on just one. 
His name is Joshua. Joshua had been with Moses for 40 years, watching God perform miracles for his people. But now Moses was gone. And the people were ready to move into the land God had promised them, but there was a moment of uncertainty. Who would lead? How would they cross that final river? How would they get the other people to move out so they could move in? If we stop to look at Joshua chapter 1, we will find an account that speaks to us still today. I want to take a moment to read the first two verses of Joshua 1. Look at them with me. After the death of Moses, a servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' aid, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then, you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I am about to give to them, to the Israelites. If you're taking notes, and I encourage you to do so, the first step in any major change in life is the call of God. The call of God. Because unless God speaks, nothing else matters. This is not about self-help. It's about God help. So how do you hear from God? I don't know about you, but the way I hear from God is I stop everything and I focus on him because I've learned that God tends to speak most clearly to those who seek him most dearly. Joshua heard from the Lord. He told him to get ready. And this is often the first thing God calls us to do as well, to get ready. When he's about to work in our lives in a big way, he challenges us to prepare whether it's your education or you're searching for a new job or a new home or a new direction or a new relationship, you don't just wing it. You have to prepare for it. So God calls us, God challenges us to prepare. But many of us know these things. We know to seek God and we know to prepare well, but we are still scared when it comes down to those big decisions in life. You're like me as I sat on that sidewalk before the race thinking, If I leave now, no one will know. And if we do, we miss out on God's best because we're unwilling to step out in faith and find something new. This is why God's emphasis to Joshua in this calling emphasizes courage. I want you to circle the word courage in your Bible if you have it with you right now. The word is found in Joshua 1 verse 6, a second time in verse 7, and a third time in verse 9. Let me read these briefly with you. Verse 6 says, Be strong and courageous, because you will lead these people to inherit the land. Verse 7, Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave to you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. And then verse 9, a third time, he says, Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. There are many insights here, but if you look at 3, in verse 6, the reason for courage is connected with God's power to give them the land. God's power. In verse 7, courage is connected with obeying God's promises. And in verse 9, courage is connected with God's presence. So let's take a look at each of these for a moment. First, with God's power. Write that down. Because God's power had already given the Jewish people freedom from slavery, gave them food and water in the desert, protection from their enemies, and now this power would open the Jordan River and help them take the land from those in Jericho and beyond. And there's a principle here for us. I like to say that with God on our side, the fight is not even fair. There is no battle too great for our God. Even death could not keep Jesus down. I like to say the nails did not keep Jesus on the cross. It was his love for us that kept him there. And second, let's look at God's promises. Verse 8 that I read says, Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it then you will be prosperous and successful. It's interesting that Joshua did not have the Bible we have today. He only had Genesis through Deuteronomy, yet he was told to know it and to obey it, just as we are today. Many times we miss out on God's blessings because we either do not know his word or we do not obey his word, and both are important. 
I like James 1.22 in the New Testament that teaches, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Now, when my son Ben was young, he loved Legos. When he was four years old, we started building them together. I would do most of the building and he would help. But by the time he was eight, he was building and I watched. What was the difference? Well, he closely followed the directions and applied them. Now, I've seen some kids dump a new Lego set out of the box and just start sticking blocks together. And it never ends up looking like the set on the box. Why not? They weren't following the directions. To succeed God's way, to succeed God's way, we must closely look at his words and follow them. As God said to Joshua, then you will be prosperous and successful. There's a condition there. But then third, let's look at God's presence. God says in verse 9, Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. These words closely resemble the Great Commission in Matthew 28, 20, where Jesus said, I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. Now know this, God never sends us into battle alone. We are never on a solo mission with God. I don't watch much television, but I recently started watching one of the seasons of that reality show Alone on the History Channel. Maybe you've heard of it or watched it. Well, in the season, I watched 10 people are dropped alone in the Arctic to see who can last the longest, up to 100 days. Some of the people are highly trained in survival. They're ex-military type, survival training experts. But what often bothers contestants more than survival is the loneliness. Many people simply cannot handle the solitude of days without other people. But with God, we are never truly alone. Sometimes people ask me what I think about when I run, for example, and I really never get bored because I'm usually praying. I'm talking with God. I'm not lonely. I don't feel alone. I enjoy the time away from work and distractions from my phone or the computer Uh, to hear just from him, to talk with him. So my devotional time may look strange to other people, but it works for me. I'm never alone because God is with me wherever I go. Let's pause here and look back at how this applies to our lives. Let me ask first, are you relying on God's power in your life? If you're not taking on something right now that is bigger than you, or if you're trying to do something on your own without praying, You were like that bee that keeps running into the window. This time, this time, this time. But the results are the same. You're stuck. You need God's power to move forward and to fly like you're designed. Let me ask you second, how are you doing with God's word? Are you spending time with scripture? And I'm not talking about just reading it or memorizing a verse. I'm talking about meditating upon it like it says in these verses. That means you're thinking about God's promises instead of the stats of your favorite sports team or the next episode of your favorite show. If we spent as much time in God's word as we did on YouTube or on television, revival would break out in our community. It's not about lacking time. It's about lacking focus. So invest your time in God's promises and watch your courage grow. Instead of the negativity of our online world, you could be building yourself up in the faith to make eternal impact. And then third, are you experiencing God's presence? This is more about a way of life than about your prayer life. Even though I believed in Jesus when I was 12 years old, I did not discover how to really pray or live for God moment by moment until I was 17. I went through a time of crisis, and I began the simple practice of reading Scripture and applying what I learned. Now, I grew up in southern Indiana, and therefore I'm a big fan of Abraham Lincoln. Uh, did, I don't know, maybe you didn't know this. Uh, did you know that the great American president, Abraham Lincoln, was raised in a one-room log cabin? And even though he was born in Kentucky, he was raised in southern Indiana, only about 30 minutes from where I grew up. So as a child, we took a field trip as a class to a replica of his childhood home, and we saw the grave where his mother was buried when Abe was only nine years old. I was only about nine when I visited, so this memory has always remained with me. 
But as a middle school teenager, we once attended an event at a small church where there was a hayride. It was this place called Little Pigeon Primitive Baptist Church, uh, which sounded really odd at the time and still does, but it, we, we found out it's the same church that Abraham Lincoln attended in his younger years that was established in 1816. I was always impressed with Lincoln's ability to overcome adversity. How did a boy who lost his mom at nine years old and he grew up in the middle of nowhere, how did he leave such a legacy? Despite his disadvantages, Lincoln taught himself to read and later became a lawyer. Elected in 1861 as America's 16th president, he fought to keep the nation together during the Civil War and abolished slavery. But even with these successes, he was assassinated in 1865. He did not know that this would be his last day. But looking back over 150 years later, we can remember him as a person who lived what he believed and made a difference in this world. And my goal is the same today. You know, I took another challenge uh, last month called the Endless Mile. And if you're not connected with me on social media, you probably have never heard about it. But there's this little race in Alabama each fall, one little one-mile loop around a park. It's not a hard loop, but that's not really the point. Uh, the challenge is that the Endless Mile is a 48-hour race. Yes, 48-hour race. That means the clock starts ticking Friday morning at 9 a.m. and stops at 9 a.m. Sunday morning. The person with the most loops wins. And I'm still not sure exactly why I signed up for this race, except I really believe God wanted me to do it. I mean, for me, it was like a retreat where I could listen to worship music and pray and encourage people and stay up all night without using my phone for two days. I would literally sign up just to have two phone-free days. And maybe you can relate. But as you can imagine, the race starts off fun, but eventually turns into a pain fest. And I had several personal bests at 50K, 50 miles, even 100K in like 11 hours and something. That's 62 miles for those who uh, don't know what 100K means. But at 21 miles, I even hit, or 21 hours, let me say it right, I even hit 100 miles. Uh, even with some breaks, I was able to stumble around the course for about 44 of the 48 hours, so some short sleeping breaks. I ended up reaching 165 miles. It was a personal best for me and enough for second overall. Now, this was my seventh time to run 100 miles or more, but only my first race since last year. I was determined that there was no pandemic, no tornado hitting our neighborhood, or any other obstacle that would stop me from making the most of every moment in this life and living for God. Now, I mess up a lot still. I don't want to give you the wrong idea. In fact, I still mess up every day. But I'm trusting God's power, God's promises, and God's provision to see me through. You know, after the endless mile ended finally, 48 hours later, I didn't realize what a big deal it was until a few days later. Uh, someone had pointed out a website of the top ultra-running performances of 2020 online. And when I checked it out, I saw my name was in third place for 48-hour male runners in the United States. And yes, I know a lot of races were canceled this year that may have made this better than other years for me, but I praise God at that moment. Because this little guy who grew up in a national forest hiking for hours with a canteen of water and his dog was now listed as a top national altar runner. This guy who could barely walk up the steps six years ago without panting could now run for days at a time. What was the difference? It's right here in these verses. Be strong and courageous. Be strong and courageous. You know, when you think about it, God didn't change, but he changed me. You do know that Joshua didn't lead the people across the river after walking with God for one day. He had watched God work in his life for over 40 years. So when the time came and when his moment arrived, he was strong and courageous. And we remember him today as one of the greats of the faith. Let me ask you, how will you be remembered? How will you be remembered? Will you be remembered for what you did for yourself or what you did for God and for others? Will you be known as a person who is strong and courageous? Or will you be known as the person too fearful to take on the challenges and new opportunities God brings your way? I have to say, the longer I walk with God, 
the more I realize he often calls us to take action we would not expect. I also learned an important lesson through another book I read some time ago called The Obstacle is the Way. The Obstacle is the Way. It's a great book by a business writer named Ryan Holiday. It's based on Stoic philosophy, and the basic concept is that the way to overcome a problem is to go through it. Because too often we avoid problems by running away from them or going around them or over them or under them, but sometimes the best option for growth is to go through them. When Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, he knew what was coming. He was not surprised, but he didn't want to take on the pain he saw. He prayed, not my will, but yours be done. He took on pain and suffering because of the outcome it would produce. When he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping, do you remember what he said? He told them, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Those are such profound words. Because spiritually, we can take on much more than our body is willing to face. Our body is filled with nerves that tell us to stop long before our body really needs to stop. We crave comfort rather than doing hard things. We want God to roll out a red carpet and show us what to do next. But God's plans are often not that tidy. You know, I used to pray like many of us do, God, open the door you want me to take. You ever do that? You say, God, open the door you want me to take. Show me which way you want me to go. But as time has gone by, I realize that's not the only option because now I pray, God, open Show me an open door or tell me which door to kick down. Because a faith like Joshua is not timid. It is courageous. Let me challenge you not to step away from this message without considering where you should become more courageous in your own life. Whether it's getting more serious about God's word or a change at work or in your family or education or a relationship, life is short. Let's do what God has called us to do while we have the time. Let's be strong and courageous. Why? Because the Lord our God is with us wherever we go. And let me be clear, the place to start is with a relationship with God. If you're not sure where you stand with him, you can begin today. Romans 10, 9, and 10 tells us to confess with our mouth Jesus is Lord. Believe in our heart God raised him from the dead, and you will be saved. It's not complicated but it will change your life completely. There's no magic potion or prayer. We just believe Jesus is who he says he is and commit your life to him and start a new life today. I do want to encourage you, though, if you do, if you pray something along those lines or say something even right there where you're watching right now, uh, reach out with a message the place you're watching this video so somebody can get back with you with some more resources and encourage you. Also, if you're a believer and you need a change, let me challenge you, just like Joshua was challenged long ago, be strong and courageous. That change God is calling you to make, do it now. Do it today. Don't delay. God's plan for your life is the best plan. Follow God's plan for your life. You will never regret it. As I said before, your goal in life is to redefine your finish line, to go beyond where you think you can go today to where God will have you go tomorrow. And if you do, and when you do, God will bless you, God will be with you, God will strengthen you, and God will change you and those around you in ways you can never imagine. Let's pray and close our time together. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to be together and to talk about your word how you challenge Joshua to be strong and courageous, and how you challenge us to be strong and courageous today. And I pray for everyone watching and hearing these words that they would be challenged and encouraged to do so in their own lives. Lord, you know that none of us is perfect. We have no chance apart from you, but with God all things are possible. So those who need to commit their lives to you, I pray they would do that. Those who are struggling and discouraged, who need to come back to you and to gain some courage from this message and these words, I pray they would do so and follow through. Pray for all of us, help us to stay loyal and faithful to you, but not just to settle and to stay where we are, but to move forward in faith, knowing that you are with us, that you will guide us and strengthen us wherever we go. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen.